Hi there! Welcome to a new episode of the Synth Project where we are going to build a synth together. Based on the findings from the SSI2130 experiments, I designed some circuitry that will help the VCO work better in those areas where we found some pitfalls. I came up with six small circuits to be added to the original schematic that will help to deal with impedance adaptation, DC coupling, limiting the signal amplitude on certain inputs to prevent overload on the IC, and a few other things. Today we will talk about the first three of these circuits, and we will test them with the rest of the VCO to make sure that they do the job for which they were designed. The remaining three circuits will be examined in the next episode. So, get ready for something very interesting to watch, and let's begin! Hi there! I am Carlo Carrano, and this is Electronics Engineering Made Easy! Before actually assembling the new circuitry, I decided to give it a run through a simulator that I found online at this website. And don't worry, the link is in the description below. The site is free for use for hobbyists. Whatever circuit you design with this tool, it will be stored in the cloud and can and will be shared with a whole community of other enthusiasts. But if you are planning to make something you don't want to share, you can still do so as long as you go with a paid subscription that will give you also more interesting features. The site is handled by Siemens and it seems to me that it provides a very good tool to run simulations very easily. Full disclosure, I don't have any association either with Siemens or the site or any other company related to them. I just use it because I like the simplicity of use and the precision of the results. Let's talk now about the first of the three circuits of today. First, since we found that some of the outputs have a DC component to it, we need to remove it, and we also need to adjust the amplitude of the signal to reach the plus-minus 2.5 volts peak amplitude that we have decided to obtain from all the signal inputs. The removal of the DC component from the signal is very easy to obtain with the simple addition of a series of capacitors, C1 in this picture. Since the signal generated by the SSI2130 goes from 0 to plus 2.5 volts, we will need to double its magnitude to reach the plus minus 2.5 volts we decide. The capacitor is therefore followed by an op-amp that will act as an amplifier by 2, with the resistor values in this picture. Actually, you will probably notice that R2 is of 430K, and that we will need instead of 440K to have a gain of exactly 2. And that, in fact, is what I did in the final circuit. Initially, though, I thought to use a slightly smaller gain to stay on the safe side, but it ended up not being necessary. So, although the simulation is done this way, the final circuit that will go on the BCO will have an R2 of actually 440K. The capacitor, however, intrinsically makes a high-pass filter when put in series with R1. And since we want to go as low as possible with the frequency to avoid distorting low frequency waves, I calculated the capacitor so that the cutoff frequency of this filter is only 0.33 Hz. This guarantees the elimination of the DC component while at the same time avoiding any attenuation of frequencies in the audible range. Let's now run our simulation to see if that is true. Here is the full circuit that is needed to run the simulation. I had to add a generator to provide the input signal, and I also added a sensor to measure the output from the simulation. The simulation was initially set to be executed in the frequency domain. The generator therefore provides a range of frequency from 1 to 100 Hz, which is the region we are mostly interested. And you can see the output of the simulation, which represents the attenuation of the high-pass filter in that frequency range. Note how, from 20 Hz and forward, the curve is practically flat, and so there is no attenuation, and in fact there is a gain of about 5.35 dBs. If I had R2 set to 440K, the gain would have been exactly 6 dBs, which is the value we would expect from an amplifier with a gain of 2. And here is also the result of a simulation in the time domain. The reddish curve shows the input signal, which you can see is a totally positive wave, that goes from 0 to 2.5 volts. 
The blue curve instead represents the output, which is a well-centered curve around the zero with a magnitude of plus minus 2.5 volts peak. Let's see now the behavior of the real circuit in lab. Here is the circuit printed on paper. As we already said, we use it for removing the DC component from the input signal and to adjust the output magnitude. This circuit will be used for correcting the pulse, the saw, the square and the triangular signals. The circuit will also increase the signal magnitude by a factor of 2, thanks to the op-amp polarized with these two resistors. The output signal will be centered around the ground level with a peak-to-peak -peak voltage of 5 volts, or plus-minus 2.5 volts peak. Here is how you assemble the circuit on the PCO we created in the previous episode. It is this little part here. This is an LM358 that contains two op-amps, of which right now I am using only one. At this point, I only wanted to test the circuit on a single output signal, I don't really care adjusting all the four waves for now. Here are the resistors for the amplifier negative feedback, and here is the capacitor that is supposed to remove the DC component, which I connected to the square wave output of the VCO with this white wire. I also used two oscilloscope channels and probes. The first is attached here on the VCO square wave output. The second probe is instead attached to the output of this new circuit, and so we can compare the input and the output signals at the same time. So, let's now turn on the power supply and check on the oscilloscope how the real circuit behaves. The yellow line here is the original square wave at the input of the new circuit. You can see that we have a signal that is 2.5 volts of amplitude and it is all above the 0 volts line. The blue trace, instead, is the signal coming from the output of our adapter. And based on the scale here, it looks like it has an amplitude of 5 volts peak to peak and it is centered around the 0 volts line. The shape of the output is also very good and reflects exactly the shape of the input and there is no significantly added noise. Let's now change the frequency to see if the behavior changes and uh, everything seems to be still ok. It looks like the circuit seems to behave exactly as expected through the simulation. And so we should be able to add this circuit at the four output of the VCO that require adjustments. Let's now talk about the second circuit, an impedance adapter for the sine and mixer outputs of the VCO. In these cases we just need to make sure that when we connect these outputs to another circuit in the synth, the current drawn by the other circuit will not cause a degradation of the signal quality. And to do so, we just need to reduce to a minimum the output impedance. And we can do it with this extremely simple circuit, which is called a voltage follower. By the way, if you are interested in learning more about op-amp circuits and how they work, I suggest you to take a look at the link coming up now on the upper right corner of your screen, which is a video I made a couple of years ago on how the op-amps work. And here is the result of the simulation I ran on this circuit in the time domain. This time I used a triangular wave for the input. Again, the input is the reddish diagram and the output is the blue one. You can see that the circuit replicates on its output exactly what is put at its input. The only thing that changes is really the impedance. The circuit has a very high impedance on the input, which will take the BCO output without disturbing it, and a very low output impedance, allowing for the next circuit to take the output signal without worrying if it draws a certain amount of current. And here is again the circuit printed on paper. I assembled it using the second half of the IC I used for the previous circuit. Here is the IC. Pin 1 and 2, which are the inverting input and the output of the op-amp, are connected together to obtain the voltage follower functionality. The non-inverting input is instead connected to the VCO sine wave output, which is one of the two outputs we have to take care of. The output is connected to the second channel of the oscilloscope through this probe. The first channel of the oscilloscope is instead connected directly to the VCO sine wave output, and so we can see both input and output waves on the oscilloscope at the same time. And now let's take a look at the oscilloscope. It seems like there is only one signal on the display, but in reality there are two of them, but they are superimposed because they are identical. 
Here, if I move the blue trace away, you can see the yellow trace underneath. And this proves that the voltage follower does exactly what we have seen on the simulation. It creates an output that reflects exactly, both in shape and amplitude, the input signal. Again, the only reason for this circuit is to provide a much lower impedance of the output that the VCO was able to provide, nothing else. The last circuit of today is something that I decided to add to make possible to modulate in frequency the output of the VCO. The SSI2130 has in fact two different ways to control the output frequency. One is through the exponential input, and the other one is through the linear input. We normally use the exponential input because that simplifies the generation of the notes along the octaves. But the linear input is useful too to create a slight frequency modulation around the frequency generated through the exponential input. And this allows us to create interesting effects, like the vibrato, and also the Leslie when combined with amplitude modulation through a VCA. The circuit takes essentially as input the signal coming from a LFO, or low frequency oscillator, and sends it to the linear frequency input of the SSI2130 on pin 21. The potentiometer here helps in adjusting the depth of the modulation by adjusting the level of the signal to the appropriate level for the effect we want to obtain. Since there is not much to see here with the simulation, let's examine how this circuit works directly in the lab. Here is again a printout of the circuit. The circuit works by applying to this point a variable control voltage, possibly from an LFO, and the amount of signal that goes through can be adjusted with this potentiometer. Then there is a capacitor to decouple the DC from pin 21, and this is because we only want to create a frequency modulation and not change the frequency with constant values. And finally, there is a 499K resistor to convert the control voltage to a current that can pilot the VCO. The 499K resistor is not available commercially, and so I used a combination of three different resistors to make it, like we did with other resistors in the previous episode. In this case, I put in series a resistor of 470K, another one of 27K, and a last one of 2K. And everything goes to pin 21, which is the linear control input of the VCO. Here is the circuit added to the breadboard, which is basically centered on this potentiometer that controls the depth of the population. This is the input which I connected to my function generator, which right now is set to emit a sine wave of 5V amplitude and 0.7Hz, so it is basically equivalent to what an LFO could generate. Back on the circuit, here is the capacitor in series with the potentiometer cursor, and here are the three resistors that make up the required 499K. And this finally is the blue wire that brings the signal into pin 21 of the SSI2130. I also connected the oscilloscope on the output from the first circuit we described today, from which I am taking the square wave generated by the PCO. And here is the square wave on the oscilloscope. It is a stable square wave, and that's because the modulating signal is not applied to the VCO, because the potentiometer is still all the way to ground. Let me increase the frequency a little bit, and so we can see a more noticeable effect on the modulation. There, I think 258 Hz should do the trick. If I now move the depth potentiometer, look what happens. Now the LFO signal is modulating the output of the VCO, and you can see how the depth of the modulation can be changed just by moving the potentiometer, causing an increase or decrease of the range of frequency of the modulation itself. The three circuits we have seen today will be added to the whole schematic of the VCO, to partially complete its overall design. There are still three more circuits that we need to talk about, which also need to be added to the full schematic. We will take care of those circuits in the next episode of the series. And these circuits are a clipping circuit to limit the input signals that are too strong, a transpose function to adjust the synth frequency range to the one of other instruments to which we play along, and another tuning point for the exponential converter, this one useful to correct the behavior of the highest part of the frequencies. Don't forget to subscribe if you don't want to miss the episode, and feel free to make a donation to help me to run this channel. I'll see you in the next video, and as usual, happy experiments!